Hi everyone, my name is John Anderson as the introduction and at Stille we are um, working with uh, medical devices and I'll do a really quick introduction of what we do just to set the context. Uh, I'm not here to, to sell our brand in any way or form in that way, we're here for something different. Um, let's talk about an overview and the documentation centric side that we come from and our MBSE transformation journey that we're on. I don't think we ever can stop that journey. As soon as you get contemplated, you get run over by the, the train as transformation actually is. So still in brief, uh, a fairly old company founded in 1841. Uh, and we do have two different products. Uh, let's not talk about too much of that. The first one is uh, surgical instruments, which is handcrafted in our factory. So we have three blacksmiths turning steel into uh, scissors and uh, forceps and so on. Uh, not much you can do from a model-based system engineering point of that. It's a fairly simple product for a complex solution, but um, the next one is our surgical imaging tables. And here we have um, uh, a, a robotized surgical table that interacts with a um, C-arm, which is used for minimal invasive surgery. So that's the product that we applying the transformation journey on. Uh, and it's a fairly complex product in terms of a lot of mechanical parts, uh, software, electronics, but also since it's a medical device, it's extremely regulatory. Um, regulated environment that we do this. Um, so um, our history, uh, many companies I worked with before as well, the documentation is uh, what's reviewed by the certifying body, the notifying bodies. And that's the thing that's deemed if you're doing everything you need to do to make a safe product, a working product and so on. Uh, without the certifications, you cannot enter markets like uh, Europe or or uh, US or, or so on. So it's a, a highly regulatory driven domain. Um, as I said, uh, a lot of requirements, a lot of risk management that needs to happen. All of these has different standards you apply to. Uh, design descriptions, verification and validation activities. So what does that look like in a normal product that we have? So you have your product requirements, you have your usability spec, which defines uh, the usability requirements. You have the risk management spec or plan that lives throughout the project. You have a software management plan. Uh, all this comes down to a system requirements. You have uh, hardware requirements, soft requirements. So that's broken down into what we call a subsystem requirement spec. This goes into the hardware and software design specs. And that leads into your implementation of the system. All of these documents are required to pass through the certification. Then there's a lot more than that. It's the, the plans and the, and the reports and so on. But that's the, the basics of it, to do a, a lowest grade class one product. Uh, this also needs to have a, uh, a test suite connected to it in form of, in form of unit tests, integration tests, verification specifications and validation specs. As I said, it's a, it's a highly document driven um, domain that we work in. 
so from here as and, and the tools are excel and word as in most companies we use them extensively uh, you do connections between them and if something happens let's say that a product requirement or usability aspect is changed then it actually falls down through many of these documents that need to be updated and so on so looking at challenges uh, so there are many there are large documents that make it hard to get an overview of the system because it's it's like having a the schematics of a of a electronic board that you try to understand what does this actually do uh, unless you're deep dug down into the design it's extremely hard to understand why do we have this what benefit does it add uh, what's the risks of it uh, and as i said if you have a change how do you make sure that all changes has been addressed in lower level documents uh, no matter what you do you have to make sure that that traceability is still there uh, and do everyone in your team have the latest revision of these documents or, or of course we do have document uh, document revision systems you you have all that in place but that's only reflecting the latest and greatest release documents if someone started something new you do not really know that until it's maybe too late and then you have a company and a domain culture uh, it's mainly the FDA in the US that sets the standard for being extremely conservative in what we do. And that's, that's something to, to, to work with. When I started my journey in, in engineering, uh, I was the first one to try to get a Linux OS through a US regulatory process. It was extremely hard. It took years of extra work. Finally, we did it. Today, it's uh, everyone does it. So just because it's a a, um, a hard work doesn't mean it's right. So looking at our MBSC transformation, uh, single source of truth. This was something that we started talking about when I was in General Electrics for HVDC transmission lines. Um, it's too easy to say that whatever has been released in a document, that's what actually is. But those documents are a momentaneous truth. It's not something uh, that has a long long longevity. So it's actually, as soon as you release the document, it's almost out of date by nature. So what we did for here is that we said that the, the model, the Capella model, is the truth. All documents to be exported based on the models. Which means that if someone holds a document, they know that this is an export. And if I want to see the latest and greatest, I do have to look at the mod. In the beginning, this was uh, a bit of a struggle, let's put it diplomatically. Uh, but what we did was that uh, we started saying, no, you can't have that in document. You have to log into the, the model and look at it. So we started building this uh, extremely small ecosystem at still we are 61 employees the majority is in actually production uh, my team we, we are five full-time employees that works with development but we outsource uh, equivalent to maybe 20 further employees full-time employees full-time equivalent so that makes us a, a, a extremely engineering heavy company, even though we don't have all the resources in-house. And to build that, we said that 
our job is to be the experts of defining our system. Whoever does the software implementation or does the layout of the electronics board, it doesn't really matter. Let's do that through partners. But we need to understand what does the system need to do? What behaviors are we wanting from the system? And that, that is the same if you're working with document-centric or if you're just using uh, normal or MBSE or model-based. The same thing applies. So we have Capella in the middle. We have an interaction with Doors Next Generation. We use Visual Studio or, or C, Embedded C. We do have some interactions into SharePoint and with SolidWorks and the ECAD. And then we can also export. All of those are bi-directional inputs and outputs from Capella, but to the, the office suite in form of a PowerPoint or Word or, or Excel, it's a unidirection. Um, nothing comes back from those documents into the model. So the documents are driven from the model. The implementation is based on the model. And in the bottom, doors next generation drive the requirements to the model. Um, doing medtech, it's a, a challenge to work agile uh, since you have to have a, a certified development process according to the standard 13485 or 62304 standard for software. Um, so what we have is a, a normal V model. I think we all seen these, we all used it, we understand how it works and we know the ups and downs with it. When I try to highlight it, where do we use these different tools? Uh, doors are, of course, the main source for requirements that moves into the Capella models, where we look at the design, the detailed design, how will that be tested, and how will that inf impact into the implementation? Uh, so far, I haven't found a good way to manage the risks inside of Capella, but uh, I don't know, give me, Give me a few months and I'll, I'll find a solution for that as well. Because risk management is, is an extremely tedious task in, in, uh, in medtech development. Um, by, um, by tagging requirements in the Capella, we can actually manage risks, but as a risk register, um, that, that sit, still sits in a spreadsheet, sadly. Um, so, um, our approach to this, what we started with, was basically what problem will we solve? What pain points do we have? One is that we write a shitload of documents and it's hard to find them and so on. But also, how do we actually understand what is the system? How do we get the knowledge from the surgeons or, or the clinical expertise into our product? Uh, in medical terms, that's usability. And there's a checklist of 32 pages for your usability spec. Uh, so we started saying that, okay, what behaviors are we looking at? How will we sort this out? And then we started modeling. Uh, some people call it use cases. We have it as scenarios or, or behaviors. Uh, you can call it in many names. Uh, but it starts with operation analyze for in our case. So that's where we started. Uh, by doing that, we realized, okay, we now understand what we're trying to do with the system. That's good. Uh, next step was to understand, uh, okay, what's the tool for this? What do we want to do? And uh, uh, I started out in, in General Electric. We started looking at um, Enterprise Architect. And then we had a, a small branch of people looking at, okay, 
this is Capella. What can we do with that? And in that company, we weren't mature enough to do this switch, even though it's better or worse. Uh, I'll let the, the history tell that for that company. But in Stille, we said that we want to move into a model-based solution and, and uh, I choose Capella mainly because of the uh, strict methodology of, of Arcadia, which made it harder to do beginner's errors compared to having a CCML approach and using enterprise architects. But one thing that we understood from, from day one was that we need to have a modeling manager who is responsible for our models, who is responsible for ensuring that we keep the integrity of the models right. Uh, okay, you can validate your models and, and, and go that way, but how do we ensure that people follow the, the modeling guidelines? And someone has to review this, and someone has to ensure that the team is getting constantly better at what we are doing. So that's where we started, pretty much. Um, next step was to, okay, how do we, how do we get a buy-in from the team on this? It's not a big team, but we also have things like stakeholders. You have a sales department, you have a marketing department, you have uh, the CEO or, or managing director, financials, why should we spend time on this when we don't do it in doing the documents? But that's, that's a impossible, it's almost an impossible discussion because uh, they don't see the, the problems you have with documents. So based on that, we sat down with the team and we started looking at what, what added value does this add for, for the engineers? We didn't really uh, pay too much attention to the CEO. It might be the case that in, in my role, that I'm in, in, in the top management team, I do most likely get slightly more leeway on this. Uh, so since I had my vision true, no one actually challenged me on, on saying, why do you want to do this? It was mainly make sure that it gets better. And, and that's what we've done. That's always been the goal on this. How do we make this uh, faster, better, cheaper? And that's the holy trinity, uh, quality, time, money. I usually say that you can only have two of these because it's impossible to have all three. But we're slowly getting there. And then we set up some guidelines for how do we follow up this? Because uh, we follow up on time. How much time do we spend modeling compared to doing the design on paper? Uh, when you start putting it side by side, you realize that, yes, upfront modeling takes slightly more time, but you ha have less rework in the end. And everyone can sit around the model and, and, and understand what it's used for. Of course, quality. Uh, what we see is less uh, quality issues with, uh, with the science, uh, less issues in communications between uh, cross-functional teams, less issues when we outsource implementation based on the design. So quality-wise, we, we try to track that as well. Uh, but the biggest ones is, of course, cost. And this is the one that uh, everyone is chasing teams about, usually. How much money can you save by doing this? It's not, uh, it's not the understanding you have to invest to, to cut costs. But in this case, we, we looked at uh, the design, and we looked at uh, when we sat to review um, the system exchange, uh, interaction exchange diagrams, we looked at that and uh, 
and realize that, oh, that's a good question. Why do we actually do this in this sequence rather than just doing it that way? That's that you obviously want to do, but sitting around talking to it with the mechanical engineer, the electrical engineer and the, and the software guy, you realize that, oh, you can't release the clutch of the table before you release the brakes, then it starts moving and so on. Uh, so we started putting money on that. What if we had gone with this before on the old system way of doing it? And we came to some staggering numbers in terms of, of several hundred thousand euros in uh, cut waste, you could say. Because you have to later on in, in verification phase, you need to you realize that, oh, this is not behaving as you wanted it to behave. So you have to go back, redo. And uh, yeah, it takes it takes a huge amount of time to, to certify this product. So that that was one of the big upside of this. So where are we in this solution? We we are looking at uh, uh, we've done the operation analyze stages for what we want to do. We looked we have looked at functional chains. We've done some system architecture. Uh, we managed to to understand to get the requirements in on different blocks. Um, we also started to look at uh, the physical architecture. For, for a for a in this case a hand control, we wanted to use this hand control as a standard component. So we wanted to do some Capella libraries and start start working from that end as well, because we can see that we want to reuse like circuit board specific circuit boards or or hand controls or or software entities in a way that we we want to to have. Uh, all of this has taken us into to a path now that we looking to see or I say like this, what we have in front of us is understanding how do we validate or verify and validate properly. Uh, I know you can do that in, in, in your requirement ways and you can say you can specify how do you want to validate and require it. But it's also how do we connect this properly into exporting into documents and and I'm uh, looking forward to see the M2 doc, how that comes out properly. And uh, yeah, I think I think in in a year's time we we come fairly far in this. Uh, okay, we didn't start from scratch because most of us are 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 senior engineers, but still it's been it's been some interesting pass in buy-ins from from management teams and uh, we can see when we we display something to customers that we work closely to or or where we have an intersection of our product with their products and we start coming to those meetings with uh, with, with models and uh, and functional chains and, and stuff like that uh, i actually had a big german company asking me so what what tools are you actually using for this and we said, okay, we're using Capella because it's a, a strict methodology and it, and it ticks all our boxes. And it turned around to the, to the engineering director of this multi-hundred people company and said, are you using anything like this? Uh, no. Well, start using it then. So we, we're kind of trying to advocate as well the tool when we're out meeting our customers and the and and so on so it's slowly moving in in the in the right direction i think uh it's gonna shift time um so uh, i quickly moved over a couple of these so i would say um Any questions on that? So thanks for these presentations. And yes, we have a few questions. Uh, and 
think we're full of time to answer it. So, well, first one is, how do you trust the change of a document that affect another one? Uh, is it performed in an automatic way? Uh, in, in the old fashioned way, you, you create a traceability matrix that uh, if something changed, you can see that this requirement is affected by this requirement, and then you can track that, that link. Um, so that's what we, we, we want to do here as well. When we have a change in, in Capella, we can go into the model and say, oh, how does this affect it? And then, of course, if you start changing something, you understand how you can track that further down the route through the traceability matrix of, of, uh, of the Capella system. Um, so it's, it's fairly the same way. You need to build your traceability matrix so you understand how the requirement and the test cases are linked together. Uh, what you don't have in the document path is that you can't really understand uh, how is this design affected by a change in the requirement. That, that takes uh, quite a lot of, of uh, analytical skills to do and need to understand the system fully. So in Capella, I think it's easier because you have your requirements and design and you can link them together, which is extremely hard to do in, in, in a document-centric world. I hope that answered the question. Uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, the second one is a bit provocative, but uh, I, I will just read it. Uh, when you ask for a return on investment before moving to MBSE. If you would ask for a return on investment. Uh, I think we, we did this as a... Uh, I put one of my engineers to say that I want you to look at uh, Capella, MBSE. And she said, you want me to look at what? Oh, it's fairly simple. It's like uh, drawing boxes and, and connecting with dots. It's, you'll understand it when you see it. And she started out with uh, the catapult, as I think many have done, uh, moving on to the weather uh, system. And that's how we build the business case for, for ensuring the cost. Of course, it does help that... that um, in, in my role, I do have, as I said, some, some uh, room to wiggle. Uh, so we, we pretty much did a, a Ninja implementation on, on a very low level. And then we presented it to, to the board of directors to say, this is what we're gonna do. It's not about wanting your approval. This is what's best for the company and backed up with numbers though. So. And that gave us the, the uh, okay to send people to, to train with Pascal. And we, we reached out to Stefan and we looked at the reuse company and so on. So I think uh, to play it a bit short, um, we, we knew this was the right way to go. So we, we did a, a grassroots implementation of it and then showed the results. Okay, and to continue this topic, uh, could you share on metrics that you're following up time, cost, quality? Uh, yeah. Uh, you want to know how, how we do the follow-up on that? I assume that's what Marcus is asking, yes. <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of, of, uh, of quality, we track uh, quality defects in, in the system. Uh, we, of course, we validate the model uh, on a regular basis when, when we do the development, uh, but we also uh, when we review areas, we, we track and, and record the, the findings of it. It's not to uh, write anyone on the nose saying that 
oh, you've done something wrong. Uh, I would say that we encourage people to, to do something wrong because then we know what not to do. Um, so, so we track defects and we, if we find a defect, we, we find a way and we do update the modeling guidelines. It could be anything like, uh, uh, I, it's hard to find something straight top of my head. Uh, cost wise, it's, uh, we, we look at cost savings. Uh, compared to other other stuff, and and we do track how long does does this roughly take to do. Uh, but of course, we do have a, a project budget that we need to stick to as well. Okay, and the second part of the question is, what are you saving? Uh, what we are saving, uh, of course, we we in terms of cost, we don't do any savings because we haven't spent anything. You you stop. Uh, Wasted time. That's what you what you what you save. Okay, but have you some figures? Uh, I don't have any figures I can share. Sadly. Okay. But but Thanks. in terms of, of cost wise, I would say that we uh, the 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 project we looked at in that project we saved a, a couple of hundred thousand euros. Not not uh, save, but we stopped the spending yes. unnecessary funds. Thanks for that. And well, next question is about uh, okay, the requirement management. But maybe how do you manage your requirement you export? Um, and uh, and to complete this question. Uh, how do you manage configuration and change? Uh, today, we have one peop one person managing the, um, the, uh, the model. We are looking to, to start running teams for Capella um, to ensure that we can, can uh, use it as any repository. Uh, Managing the change in terms of, of um, requirements. Uh, today, it's, it's a, a manual labor to put it back into doors. Um, we haven't found a good way of, ex sorry, good way to export from from the model in and import it into doors. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's basic because we don't have had the time yet. But revision of the model. Uh, yeah, I, I, I assume uh, I assume that in the in the mind of the pe people asking uh, generation of requirement from the model is an equivalent to produce uh, uh, an old-fashioned requirement document with a requirement number or something like that, and so probably. Yeah. When you send something to the model and you're not considering the model itself as a requirement, uh, you can have troubles to uh, regenerate exactly the same ID and so on. So that's, that's probably why he's asking. Uh, this yeah, I, I would say that this is uh, we just started using the requirements properly. Um, uh, the requirement set that uh, that's live. Uh, sits indoors and gets imported through the RecIF Rec import into Capella, and then it's connected up. Uh, so, so it's a bit, uh, um, it's a bit too early to say uh, this works as intended, or if we need to strengthen our process for this. Okay. Uh, but as I said, this is this is where we are. Okay, so I hope I. I've properly understood this question. I'm not fully sure about that. Uh, <laughs> a very, very interesting question now. Do the regulatory bodies accept the model as an evidence? No, they don't. <laughs> OK. So that's, you have to. That's, uh, that, that's why we still need to export it to documents. Um, I would say that, uh, and this is me going out on a limb guessing. I do think for compliance with MDR that's uh, coming live in May, 
I do think you could have some degree of modeling as a proof of, of a system. Uh, in terms of FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, they would simply say, uh, so is it, uh, can, you, can you ensure this by digital signatures? And then they say, well, no, Capella isn't approved for FDA according to section 14 of, uh, of digital signatures. And they say, well, then this doesn't mean anything. So you still need to, to export it. And even the document in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in your computer doesn't actually mean anything. So you need to print it and hand sign it. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's the way of conservatives we're looking at. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, um, last question. Okay, uh, uh, I will try to read this one, but okay. Uh, the trade of tools, okay. No, clearly, I, I just don't understand the question, so I'm sorry about, about that. Uh, but well, I will keep this, keep this last one. So, uh, thanks, thanks for that, John. It was quite interesting. And well, if you have additional question, I invite all the attendees to to contact you. And well, thanks to to have been yeah. with with us today, and I will prepare the next the next talk. And thanks for a really good. Uh, Capella days. Yeah, thanks. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Cheers.